Hey cats, it's Ed Midsolsky here. Today I'm discussing running shoe sequels. More often than not, we're seeing running shoe brands recycling and remixing their original ideas and producing these sequel shoes, these improved versions, better than the last ones, though we know that isn't always the case. Do we always need a sequel to our favorite running shoe? Let's discuss. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in people, it's always appreciated. Hit that subscribe button and also give this video a thumbs up like, it really helps out. Danke schön. We keep seeing brands recycling their original ideas into a new version of our favorite shoe. Sometimes it works, sometimes not so much. There are models now into the 30s or 40s like the Asics Kayano series or perhaps the Nike Pegasus model. But are we seeing any real improvement in that model of the shoe? Is it just a cookie cutter sequel to try and get the same people to buy the same shoes every year? Let's take a look at a few models and see what's happening. First up on the block is the Nike Pegasus. Over the last four versions, we've had a React based midsole with some air units chucked in for good measure, sometimes in the forefoot, sometimes in the rear, sometimes both. You could say it's quite the departure from the 35 or 36 era, which was a Cushlon midsole with a full length zoom air unit. I think Nike deliberately keeps this one pretty similar due to the price point. They want to produce something that's kind of like a middle of the road shoe. The upper is always fairly similar. The stack height is always going to be a few millimeters off that max cushion. They want to sell other shoes to you for that. And it's a reasonably versatile outsole. So I think they deliberately keep it quite similar. Is though that's still what people want in 2023? I mean, we're almost in 2024. People's requirements these days are a little bit different. People want more max cushion there, more stack. And I think that's actually showing within the elite sort of athletes. A lot of them are running in sort of more max cushion shoes on a daily basis. That's helping them to avoid injury, perhaps running more miles, getting fitter and fitter. Personally, for a daily shoe these days, I do tend to opt for those slightly more cushioned models. Then I use the flatter, less cushioned things for the speed sessions. I think that's perhaps why a lot of everyday runners are opting for something like the Triumph 21 over the Pegasus these days. I always look back to an interview with George Thorogood and someone had described his music as being quite similar, you know, he's doing the same thing each time. And to respond to that criticism, he said, well, you know, people like cheeseburgers. If you make a really good cheeseburger, then people will continue to eat it. And I guess, what's wrong with that? I think the Pegasus does a job. It certainly hasn't been a massive departure from the original idea. It still sits in the same box there as the daily do-it-all shoe. Though I do think a few people have moved away to other brands from the Pegasus model simply because it hasn't really showing that much innovation over the last few years. I think it's a warranted update, though people are calling for a materials update on that one. The gel Nimbus model's gone through many changes over the last few years. We had the Nimbus 23 that had a medium stack with a flight foam propel midsole foam. We then went to the Nimbus 24, which had a flight foam blast plus midsole. And now the 25 and 26 have got flight foam blast plus eco. The eco version, definitely firmer than the one that we had in the 24, I can tell you that. And of course, less gel in recent versions too. I think ASICs have realized that gel technology does add quite a bit of weight and I don't think it's the selling point that it was before. Perhaps more seasoned runners that have used the model, if they have the gel name there at least, that might pull them in. I mean, it's obviously there hidden away in the heel of the 25 and 26, but we don't have a visual sighting of the stuff around the heel anymore. It's the classic method of using tech to sell running shoes like Nike's Air Soul or even the Reebok Hexalite. Now, I think the Nimbus has moved on from being something like a daily type shoe to more a max cushioned model these days. I think perhaps that shows that ASICs are looking at what people really want rather than what they think they need, rather than knocking out the same old product regardless. The Invincible Run 3 from Nike. I've just seen this model go downwards, really. I think the very first version was the best. They've done everything they can to seemingly nerf the properties of the Z-Max and also make the shoe not all that comfortable in terms of the upper. A number of viewers commented that they had heel slip in the Invincible Run 3. I didn't experience that myself, but it certainly scored very highly in terms of the viewers' least used shoes or their sort of worst purchases in 2023. As I say, I still think the original version of the Invincible Run from Nike was the best. 
They fooled around with the strobel stitching on the version 2 and 3. There was no strobel board on the first version and I think you were a little bit more connected to the Zoom X material. Gave you a little bit more of a squashy, bouncy, exciting feel, I suppose. As such, I feel that model will need to refresh to sort of bring it back to what made it stand out in the first place, rather than trying to fix problems that simply weren't there. Moving on to Saucony. I think the Endorphin Speed original, certainly the best version of that shoe, did we really need a sequel? It was mega light, mega responsive, and just very exciting, nimble shoe to run in. Yet the V2 and V3 are quite the departure from that, really. I found the V3 a little bit too squashy almost, and it had that winged plate to try and increase the stability, perhaps make it more usable on a daily basis. I never had any issues with stability in the original version of the Endorphin Speed, I just wish that they'd kind of started making that shoe again. Maybe just refined the upper a little bit. That's all it needed. It was one of the best non-race shoes for racing and training. Does that make sense? The original nylon plate and midsole geometry there was perfect. Though, was it too good perhaps up against the Endorphin Pro series? Maybe the speed robbed a few sails away from their top line shoe. I don't know. That could account for the changes there, trying to position it more into a training model. So that's definitely a series where I feel that the sequels haven't got better and the original is kind of the best. A little bit like Star Wars, I suppose. Some of you may disagree with me, but I still think that A New Hope is perhaps the best Star Wars film and that series got worse as they made more and more of them. And that's the case now, isn't it? Now I consider the Vaporfly 4% as the original version V1, the Flyknit upper model was V2, and then the subsequent Vaporfly next percent models is three, four, and five. Now that latest version of the shoe has an upper that I just can't get on with. It's just far too bulky in this area of the shoe, though they have improved the durability of the midsole somewhat. I could even get away with going up a half size in the Vaporfly next percent two. That was ideal in the toe box. Lots of flexibility, but not too much height. So are all the changes in the Vaporfly model purely cosmetic to try and sell the same design idea to the same people year on year? Is it all a step forward? Well, I don't think it is really in this line. The Flyknit upper in the Vaporfly 4% Flyknit was amongst the best ever. It was just fantastic in terms of racing and comfort. The Vaporweave in the first version of the Vaporfly Next% percent was ideal it was foot hugging it was light it didn't take on any water the midsole in fairness has changed very little over the last few versions the weight of the shoe is pretty much almost exactly the same every time and with the outsole they've not really done anything to improve the durability that much it's slightly better this time around though i have seen horror stories of that i do remember tom from the run testers the first race he used the Vaporfly 3, the whole rear rubber strip just fell off. It just came off during the run. So in terms of that model, I don't actually see that much improvement really. It's still the same stuff. It's the same materials. They just rejig it around every time. And I think that's why we've got really poor sales on the Vaporfly 3 this time around. There's loads of pairs of those sitting everywhere. Just lazy updates. Now, the Takumi Sen series is one that's changed drastically over the last few models. The sequels have been almost like completely different shoes, in fact. If we look back to the 6 and 7, we had a race flat type vibe with a glove-like narrow upper and traction that was more made for the track. Now the shoe is heavily refined to be a more short-range road racer with that coarse flat rubber traction and a midsole which is a more scaled back version of the Adios Pro series with that Light Strike Pro material. It's definitely a shift away from the dedicated track use that the Sen always kind of fitted into really. It's a shoe that you can pretty much use on a daily basis, maybe do some speed sessions, maybe even some racing too. I think that's why it's been such a popular model over the last couple of years from Adidas. It's perhaps not what was originally intended for the Takumi Sen design, but I think it makes one of the most versatile and exciting models out there on the market right now. I can't wait for the Sen 10 to release. I've tried out loads of those and I think that says a lot really about the changes that they've made. They're very subtle, they're very refined, and it's just becoming a better and better shoe because of it. What do you make of all these running shoe sequels, people? What are the most and least warranted running shoe iterations over the last few years? Let me know your thoughts and opinions down in the comments.
Quick musical interlude for you. I've been listening back to an album from 2006 called Prairie Wind from Neil Young. There's some great tracks on this one. It feels a bit like a partner album to his very famous Harvest release back in the 60s. Or is that 70s? Early 70s, maybe. My favourite on here is It's a Dream. It's a beautiful country piece, quite a slow tempo, wonderful acoustic guitar sounds, and some lovely pedal steel in there too. And the soaring strings that accompany parts of the verses and chorus really do elevate the track to that sort of higher level. There's a great song on there as well called This Old Guitar, which I think is all about a guitar that Neil Young owns that used to be owned by Hank Williams. And he's kind of talking about how guitars are just sort of looked after by whoever's got them at that time and they'll outlast everybody and somebody else will own it after him. Probably won't be me though, because I would imagine that guitar's worth a lot of money. Go and check this one out, people. Prairie Wind from Neil Young. Thanks for tuning in. It's always appreciated. Hit that subscribe button, but also give this video a thumbs up like. My name's Ed Budd, and I'll be seeing you.